So good afternoon all. Uh, we began the environment lectures with a very fine talk by Professor Madhav Kargil. Uh, we also had one by Dr. Olson. It's a great privilege today to welcome uh, Dr. Gopi Sundar. Uh, my distinguished colleague, Dr. Bharat Sundram, will do the formal introduction. I just want to say that I first encountered Gopi in 98 in a seminar with, where most of the papers were on big animals, tigers, elephants, lions. And they were about forests, wildernesses, and mountains, and such places. And Gopi was a fascinating talk because he was already engaged with a, one of the most fascinating birds, certainly in North Indian and Central and Western Indian cultures, the Saras. And it was a fascinating talk because they were cultivators, farmers, villagers, fields. So I think Dr. Sundar over the last quarter century has brought... Century? Uh, I'm not uh, that old. Quarter century. <laughs> quarter century. Did I say century? Yeah. Quarter century. Quarter century. Quarter century. Since, since the late 90s has brought to our attention a larger uh, landscape and waterscape than perhaps many of us were inclined to think about, not only in the conservation community, but the larger communities of scholarship, both in the natural sciences and I dare say in policy and in the sociological uh, sciences. I do want to add one line that there are very few people, and I'm going to say it, though he may be embarrassed, who have worked in such difficult uh, human scales. Some of the places he has worked in, uh, including districts of Western UP, which incidentally are going to hold right now, are uh, very safe for Saras cranes, not always safe for other two-legged species. And it is remarkable that along with his work, he has built enduring human relationships with a range of people, from uh, school teachers to panchayat leaders to MLAs. And in that sense, I think his work is as significant for its human dimension, which perhaps he may not be able to touch upon today, as for the ecological. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. We hope this is first of many visits to Kriya, and we also hope that the next visit will be in person. Uh, so over to you, Dr. Bharat. So, thank you, Mahesh. Thanks, Mahesh, and uh, welcome, Gopi. It is really my pleasure to welcome you to, to this talk. And uh, for the audience, uh, Dr. Gopi Sundar obtained his PhD from Minnesota University in conservation biology, passing out as the outstanding graduate of 2011. He is scientist currently uh, at the Cranes and Wetlands Program of the Nature Conservation Foundation, which has its, uh, its office in Mysore in Karnataka in India. Uh, he has over 50 scientific papers and natural history notes published and is widely regarded as a world expert for several large water bird species, including the Saras crane and the black neck stock. Uh, his work covers human modified landscapes in Nepal, Australia, India, and he's working with colleagues and students across the African continent as well. His primary interest is to understand how birds are, do, uh, uh, how birds are doing, uh, whether humans and birds can get along, and if so, under what conditions, <laughs> and to improve studies on poorly understood species in areas where scientific work has been minimal. He was recently awarded the Carl Zeiss Award for bringing attention to wetlands and water birds in India. So without further ado, welcome Dr. Gopi Sundar and over to you. Thank you. I'm a little bit taken aback by the very, very distinguished uh, people who have decided to join the talk today. I hope the talk will do some justice and uh, I hope you haven't entirely wasted your time. So the uh, talk today, I have framed it in a way that uh, hopefully challenges the imagination of uh, younger people. Uh, my imagination was certainly challenged by uh, some of the peers who are listening in today and also by other peers who, uh, who, have, who have been the doyens of uh, uh, conservation of uh, ornithology and of uh, various things wild in India. And the reason that I put this talk together the way uh, that I have is a juxtaposition of actual data versus some of the ways in which birds are regarded. And birds is the lens that I will use because that's what I'm most comfortable with. Uh, as birds are regarded with respect to areas in which human beings have taken over. So the uh, title of the talk should tell you that uh, I am going to question some of the assumptions. And uh, those of you who have read the abstract will see that we now have evidence to really question them in terms of why are these assumptions not working out in the Indian context. So that's uh, sort of the plot already revealed to you early on. And you will see the in some of the, way, the, some of the very distinctive ways which have really struck me as uh, being uh, sort of outliers, if you will, of uh, an ecology textbook or of uh, an ecological understanding of something like birds, which are of course ubiquitous. We, uh, many of us have connected to nature because of birds uh, as children, as uh, people who have grown up. And so birds are very distinctive in uh, not just being everywhere, but also being connectors of various human beings 
of all sorts. We know about Indira Gandhi writing to Dr. Salim Ali because she used to see a red star coming to her, uh, to her house in Delhi. We know about many other way, uh, famous people whose connection with uh, natural history and whose connection with uh, the sense of place around them was built up very strongly with birds. So I think it behooves us now to look at it in Indian context and to see if many of the assumptions that are derived from studies largely in uh, developed countries uh, actually pan out in our context. So to give you a very, very quick overview, this is something that many of you will already be aware of. This is what the protected area map of India looks like. I have not split some of the uh, states and not included one or two dots that have uh, recently been formed, particularly in Karnataka and Maharashtra. But for most part, about 5% of India's geographical area, give or take uh, half or 1%, depending on what you would call protected area, are under uh, strict protection, primarily for the sake of benefiting wild species. So obviously, if you, in the Indian context, 95% is assumed not to be useful for wildlife. And that is another thing that I will question today. So if you look at uh, uh, ecological textbooks, one thing that will hit you again and again and again as you go through wild species and wild habitats, also trends in biological diversity, trends in how ecosystems shape themselves and also aspects that uh, uh, cause changes in ecosystems. The one thing that will jump up at you is human population density. So the vast majority of textbooks today will tell you that as the human population grows, then everything that is natural will decline. It will either decline in actual numbers or it will decline in quality. So in that sense, if you look at the global position of India today, then you can see that the purples, which is most of uh, uh, northern and central China, and the Indo-Gangetic floodplains all the way to Pakistan, uh, uh, from, from Pakistan all the way to Bangladesh, have the highest population density of uh, any landscape anywhere in the world. And these are not tiny pockets, as you will see in the map, but these are contiguous, large areas with very, 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 very high human populations. Also, along with human populations, you end up with a map like this, which is now becoming more and more important as urbanization increases, particularly in the context of India, we are seeing a huge number of smart cities, a huge number of mega cities coming into place. And if you look at the big red dots, those are, the, those are what is termed by the UN as the mega city uh, populations of 10 million or more. And you will see very quickly that small areas uh, like India and uh, also uh, China have most of the mega cities in the world, and they also have some of the highest densities of other cities of all sizes. So clearly, these two should tell us that we are living in a completely modified system. Finally, you look at something that is also caught the imagination of a lot of people for very obvious reasons, and I'll uh, showcase some of those reasons in the next couple of slides. And this is farming. And farming really stands out where India is... Uh, uh, astonishing in the in the way that you know these are done by grids grids are small squares and uh, they put in amount of those squares that are agricultural areas so areas the grids that uh, had 90 percent or more of those squares as agricultural areas are represented in red here so those are the areas that are uh, uh, widely believed to be almost entirely converted to raise food for human beings so this is complete opposite of the first map that I showed you, which was the protected area map, which is areas that we are retaining only for non-human species. So you can see that the range of uh, values uh, across the world, the biggest continuous massive landscape with the highest amount of conversion to agricultural area is also in India's destiny. And we know this from uh, agricultural studies, we know this from historical studies, and we also know this from studies of how people have been moving pulses, spices, and all sorts of things across continents for a very, very long time, that the Indo-Gangetic flood plain, the Indus plain, and several of these plains have been under agriculture, not just under large extents in terms of geographical area, but also in for a very long period of time. So if you look at uh, uh, the leading causes today, of what is believed to be causing bird declines. So the burgeoning human population obviously is the one factor that all of us know is not going very well with nature conservation or with uh, natural systems. So the one huge thing that is popping up around the world is that urbanization and also intensification of farming are uh, now more or less uh, well known to be the primary causes of uh, bird declines.
So you have things like this representing extension of urbanization, uh, increase of cities, increase of facilities in the cities. And so urbanization is not just the amount of concrete, but everything else associated with an urban area, which is water supply, the, uh, the way in which garbage is uh, taken care of, the way in which we bring in utilities like electricity wires, uh, like is shown in these photographs. So it is not necessarily restricted only to the city, but a lot of the studies have, uh, of course, looked at what happened in a city. And then you have, uh, this is sort of what I would call as semi-mechanization because my, much of the harvesting in Uttar Pradesh is still done by hand. But you now have massive moves where hand harvesting, hand threshing and everything is now moved over to machines like this. So these are supposed to be constituents in a landscape, which if they take over from what used to exist, then we believe the trends for birds should be one of decline. So what does uh, urbanization do? So this is just placing in context to showcase to you what we found. And so this I'll go over fairly quickly and we can come back to them in the question session if we have some time. So when you look at cities, uh, the global studies, which are of course heavily, heavily biased towards developed countries, and developed countries are largely in temperate areas. So those are areas with not just much fewer human population than what we have, but also they're much newer than many of our cities. Plus, they also have very systematic ways of planning, and they already have very reduced bird, uh, you know, species diversity of all taxa because they're in the temperate areas. Nevertheless, the broad uh, uh, themes that you will see as it relates to birds and urbanization is that there is more or less thought to be a rule that when there is a city and when there is increased urbanization, it reduces bird diversity. And by for this particular talk, by bird diversity, I will mean the number of species that are found in an area. There are various other definitions, which I'll not be referring to. Also, what people have found as a consequence of these studies done around the world is that uh, the individual bird species also reduce in population as urbanization increase. So these two are more or less now considered law. Uh, and then you have some very interesting nuances, and I'll allude to these nuances uh, during my talk and show you what is happening in uh, the one Indian city that I will present data for today. And contrast it with what they've been finding in the temperate areas, which is few types of birds. So things like birds that require insects, for example, insectivores, birds that require fish, you know, piscivores. So birds that require very uh, specific kinds of habitats. So they are affected far more and their decline is usually far more than other types of birds. So this is also more or less now regarded to be a rule uh, across urban areas in the world. And then another thing that is emerging now is something that's well known in protected areas, which is that small areas uh, will have the least amount of uh, diversity and they'll also suffer the most if any changes happen. And within a city, you can expect that the impacts uh, on a small habitat will be much higher, will be multiplied further is what is expected and what has been seen in many cities around the world. So if you go to small habitats around the world in cities, then the expectation is that unless they're managed for very specific things like amphibians or rare plants or birds, then you should see very, very few species in these tiny habitat patches. And this matters to the talk that I will come to and you will soon see why. So what about farming? So what does the world say about farming and what have we learned about uh, you know, increase of farming around the world and how it reacts with birds? Again, one thing common with cities, because it is concerning uh, human beings and it is concerning transformation of the entire area. The photograph will show you, you can barely see any trees except way in the distance. And this is a field of wheat and uh, uh, mustard that is ripening in Uttar Pradesh. Again, we expect to see very heavily reduced bird diversity and individual bird species will see reduced populations. Also, one thing that has become more or less a law around the world is that as farming continues on a patch of land and as the farming goes on over time, older farmlands they've seen tend to have much fewer birds than newer farmlands. Now, there are various reasons for this and there's a little bit of variation and it's not quite a law, but it seems to be a trend in many countries. Also, the last one, however, is a law uh, or thought to be a law is that farmlands with many more people using them or cultivating in them uh, represented by the number of people who live around uh, farmland areas. So all of that combined or some uh, combination thereof of those parameters also tend to have, they've noticed, fewer birds, not just the number of species, but also the uh, populations of individual bird species. So this is what we have to work with if you look at laws to uh, in the aspects that I will cover today. There are many, many other rules that have been formulated, which we will not touch today because the subject is extremely wide. Uh, 
So now this leads us to a much sort of larger question that people have been struggling with. And uh, they've been looking at, does the mere presence of uh, humans, like in this photograph, a, uh, a person appears and the whole bunch of bi uh, weaver birds take off. So photographs like this are oft uh, showcased to tell us that human beings are disturbance. And anything that humans convert becomes less of a habitat. So this relates to the larger issue of not just cities and farmlands, but also the issue of what we consider habitat and what we consider disturbance. And some of the rules there that lead to the questions that I'm posing is, can bustling cities like Delhi, and Delhi is the example that I will use today, that have continuous human presence. You know, Humans never ever go away from that uh, city at any time of the day or any time of the year. And they're there all the time. Can such areas still be useful for birds? And relating this to farmlands, can very, very old ancient farmlands and small holder farmlands, which are representative of a very high density of farmers, and that's why they have tiny bits of land that they are able to farm. Can such old and small holder farmlands still retain birds? So these are the big, two big questions that uh, I hope I'll address in the talk today. So today we'll look at diversity and numbers in Delhi ponds, and we'll particularly focus on something that is uh, a very tiny habitat because we really wanted to see it extreme of the laws that have been uh, portrayed around the world. And we have done this in a bustling mega city, which is now predicted to become one of the world's, uh, not one of the, but the biggest mega city in the world. And then we will also look at diversity and state of some individual species in North India's farmlands, both in Haryana and Uttar Pradesh. And these are very, very densely populated by human beings. And as you know, the Gangetic flood plains is known to be one of the oldest or perhaps the oldest farmland in the world. So. That's the context for you in terms of what is assumed of areas like this and uh, what it is that we are dealing with. So we've looked at two extremes. So birds in India's ponds, I did with my student Prakhar Raval, and we had a bunch of collaborators from the Amiti University from the Nature Conservation Foundation. And the talk that I'm presenting today is a result of the findings of all of us uh, working together. So when you look at cities, and I'll particularly talk about uh, birds in cities and some of the uh, existing uh, you know, theoretical aspects that people like to talk about is why bother about birds in cities at all? Because they're not supposed to be bird habitats because cities are expanding, they're increasing in numbers and you're very unlikely to be able to convert cities, especially in the tropics, back to natural areas. So why should we bother about it? But Indian cities have a lot of character. However, they are extremely highly populated. You have densities more than five to 8,000 people per square kilometer. So that's like packed like sardines. Does that make them less or more suitable for birds? We don't really know because there are very, very few systematic studies on birds in Indian cities. And then when you look at uh, small patches, the one thing that we explored was can remnant wetland habitat patches, because that's what they mostly are. They are remaining from perhaps louder patches or perhaps from uh, smaller wetlands that were created a very long time ago or were natural components of the landscape that have been retained. Can such wetland patches inside a city help retain what bird or bird diversity? So if you look at uh, Delhi, we, we pick the smallest amount of uh, the, the smallest kinds of wetlands, which are ponds and ponds are described variously, but we pick the definition, any water body that is five hectares or less is a pond for our uh, purposes and it matches definition used in cities elsewhere. So if you look at the uh, ponds in Delhi, we actually map this out using various techniques and stuff. I won't uh, uh, bore you with the details and I'm happy to share the paper with, uh, with papers with people who are interested. So if you look at the wetland extent, which is how many hectares of wetlands are found in each of these uh, hexagon, that is in the map on the left, and number of distinct wetlands in each of those hexagons, that's the map on the right, they're more or less the same. That is Northern Delhi has lots and lots uh, of wetlands and they also have within each grid, larger amounts of wetlands. And so what we did was we picked a whole bunch of grids, we did a systematic sampling, and I'll just showcase to you some of the findings that we got. The wetlands that we covered, because we used a systematic process and we randomly picked the wetlands, because we really wanted to see the state of wetlands per se. So at, at, will, at random, if you go and pick a wetland, what is likely to be the state of that wetland with respect to birds? So the wetlands were a huge amount of variety. There were things like this that were entirely concretized, uh, made into parks. There were things like this that had people with walkways on the side. They had fountains, but were still being used by birds. Uh, there were also uh, places like this, which had very, very steep slopes on the side. You can see some of the water is being extracted and uh, very few areas are actually shallow, but you still have some small remaining uh, marshy area at the far end. And then you had places like this where houses are coming up everywhere, but the wetland has still remained because by law, DDA does not allow conversion of wetlands to anything legally. What did we find? We found that 
a lot of the assumptions that are being made of uh, birds in cities in Delhi were not working out. For one, we found over 180 species of birds using Delhi. Now, to put that in context, it's a world record. There's no city in the world uh, that uh, where you have 180 species using only ponds. Remember, we only sample ponds, not the whole of the city. So this level of diversity, Delhi now has a world record because of our study. What were the kinds of species? These were not species that you would expect to see in a bustling city or in tiny ponds. And you saw some of the ponds that uh, made up the wetlands that we surveyed. These were birds that actually represent healthy systems. So you, we had uh, things like ducks that are known to have a variety of feeding habits. They eat grasses, they eat seeds, they eat uh, vegetation, they eat uh, carnivorous material. We had things like uh, the swamp hen, the purple color bird that you see is a swamp hen. And the swamp hen is a feeder of uh, vegetation. We had the uh, piscivorous uh, painted stalks. And we still have wetlands inside Delhi, which are ponds that have avocets. And those of you who know birds know that we believe avocets to require vast open areas. They require undisturbed wetlands. But there are still wetlands and tiny wetlands in Delhi that are still hosting avocets every year. We also had birds that are the... Uh, interface of uh, land and water, things like this uh, thickney. Quite a lot of thickneys use Delhi because of the scrub areas around the ponds. And then we had, to our astonishment, a whole bunch of stuff that we really did not expect. The groups of birds that we call as raptors. Raptors are representing the top of the bird uh, food pyramid because they are carnivorous birds and they constitute things like hawks and falcons and eagles and stuff. And we found quite a nice variety and quite a nice number of uh, raptors. We also had birds that require soft soil, like the bird with the open crest, the hoopoe. We have both resident and migratory hoopoes in India, and Delhi too uh, gets both. And hoopoes require soft soils because they eat grubs by digging the soil. And then we had tree nesting species because most of the wetlands in Delhi have trees around them. And plus we had a whole bunch Practically, and I'll show you some of the graphs of whether some species were affected more, because as you know, that is supposed to be one of the predictions of cities. And we had a whole bunch of these guys, uh, the sandpipers and the waders and the marshland birds, which quite frankly, we were not expecting because we thought the Delhi would match expectations that have been seen around the world. So what were the most commonest species? And this is a very interesting thing to look at uh, in cities around the world, because most of the cities think, uh, tend to have things like this one, which is also the most commonest bird in Delhi, the rock pigeon. It is uh, both feral and also native in some places. And it is by far now perhaps the commonest bird in, in, in uh, cities anywhere in the world. And Delhi is no exception. We also had house crows, which was very nice because many of you uh, may have seen that house crows seem to be declining in many places, but not in Delhi. <clears throat> and then we had things like the common miner, which is also well known to be an invasive species in, in some other countries, very successful in taking over human dominated areas. And Delhi still maintains quite a lot of common miners. And then much to our surprise, because we work in wetlands, fortunately, we still have, we had water birds as some of the commonest birds in Delhi, which is highly unusual if you look at the list of common birds of cities around the world. We had this uh, water bird, which is very common around India, fortunately, but it's still also the commonest bird inside Delhi's uh, uh, ponds. The black wing stilt is a bird that goes to feed on areas which have very high amount of uh, sewage and uh, no big surprise that it's one of the biggest uh, you know, numbers are found of black wing stilts in Delhi. And finally, this was an unusual bird and a bird that was affected negatively by the amount of concrete around the ponds. This is the only species that we found which was negatively affected by concrete. All the others didn't really show any effect. And that was the red wattle labyrinth, which many of you will, of course, know about. So the big question of were certain species affected? So this you can look at in two ways. You can look at it in terms of habitats. So what are the kinds of habitats that birds use? And in this graph, you'll see the light gray are the proportions of birds found in these various habitats. And these proportions are for birds, all the birds that have ever been listed in Delhi. That's about 420 species. And then the dark gray are the birds that we actually found. And we expect to see some variation. That is, we expected Delhi, for example, to have a lot more wetland birds, uh, sorry, woodland birds. And that's exactly what we found because we were also sampling mostly in the wetlands. But you will see many of the other habitats, you know, the, gra the grasslands, uh, the uh, open areas, the scrub areas, Roughly speaking, just looking at the ponds, the representation of these various habitat types of birds were more or less all represented just in the microcosm of ponds in Delhi, which was greatly surprising to us. There are other ways to cut and dice this pie. So if you want to look at how specifically a dietary habits, perhaps some birds with dietary habits are being affected differently. 
And much to our surprise, if you look at the proportion of birds that are found in Delhi throughout history, 420 birds or so, and Mr. Vyas has uh, written a paper on this, uh, you can see that the light gray shows the proportion of birds uh, as it relates to the diet of the bird. But to our great surprise, none of these dietary bird proportions were very different from what we found in the ponds, which means that just the pond retain almost the entirety of the diversity of dietary habits. And this is starkly different from what is being seen in other cities around the world, which are losing insectivores, which are losing uh, carnivores, like the uh, icons that we have used to depict in the, uh, in the picture. So Delhi is very unusual, clearly not just by the number of species, but also by the, the uh, quality of species that are still continuing to use the ponds. And these are stuff that I can come back to later on. We also did a whole bunch of stuff as to what affects different kinds of birds. So if you look at uh, birds that require open areas or areas with mud and stuff, then the stuff that really benefits them is the size of the wetland and not much else. But what affects them is management of ponds in Delhi, more the management intervention, less these birds were seen. So clearly the management in Delhi is not catering towards birds. It's obviously catering towards early morning walkers, people who come in the evening for jogging and people who are uh, there for entertainment. So clearly the management of the ponds requires a little bit of a shift and we need to start including our feathered friends into our consciousness because we've seen that even these tiny ponds have enormous diversity and has in fact set a world record. And then we have birds like wader. So we've done this dicing and slicing quite a bit. I won't uh, go into the details, but this is just to show you that we do have this kind of information available with us. So cities and birds, just to recap what the assumptions were based on the vast number of cities, that's, that's listed again for you. But what did we find? We found some things that were very, very contrary to what is being seen in cities. We found a pretty high bird diversity. In fact, a world, uh, like I've said many times, a world record. Uh, mostly they found uh, in the cities that as city sizes increases, the populations of individual species decline. And that seems to hold in Delhi. Most of the species that we found had very small populations, and but only few species had very large populations. So that one seems to hold in Delhi. But what about uh, systematic biases that certain birds being affected more? We found little to no evidence of that, which is a huge surprise because there is no city in the world which has retained all of the habitat and dietary guilds of the birds found in the city. And what about small habitat patches? Delhi is completely throwing that particular rule book out into the garbage can. Tiny ponds were about 0.5% of Delhi, if you look at the land area, but these ponds had nearly 40% of all of the birds known in Delhi. Clearly, tiny ponds matter in a city, and this could be because habitats are so rare that birds are sort of forced to use there or they're able to find these places. We don't really know the mechanisms driving it, but clearly Delhi is an outlier for now. So if you move into farmlands, and this is work that I've done with my colleague, uh, Swati Kitu is also my much better half. And uh, here I will show you a little bit of what we've been finding in uh, the farmlands of Uttar Pradesh and also Haryana. So farmlands as bird habitats, I'll give you a very quick update of what we've been seeing about rice. And rice cultivation is, uh, until we started our work, was being blamed for, the, for generally being a bad thing. And it is not very good for birds around the world. And what we found in India, was that nearly 27% you know, of the bird species found in India were actually using rice fields at least a little, if not for breeding and living, but at least a little. And this is amongst the highest proportions of, uh, uh, of any agricultural uh, crop that have bird diversity. So we don't have any other agricultural crop with so much bird diversity in India, except perhaps things like shade trees in coffee plantations. But that's a little bit of cheating because those birds come for the shade trees. They don't come for the coffee. So if you look at purely agricultural areas, then this seems to have the highest bird diversity. And this again, like in the case of Delhi, includes quite a variety of species that are supposed to be using woodland birds. Like for example, lesser whistling ducks are nesting in the rice, they're nesting on the dikes and the small bits of grassland. We find a fantastic variety of raptors, including things like the Bonnelly's eagle that seems to hunt down crows uh, solely. And we have a wide variety of insectivorous bird species that uh, are very familiar to many of us in cities as well and include things like the gray francolin. And we also found evidence that about 64 bird species are actually increasing due to rice. And this should not be a big surprise for those of you who've been watching birds because many of the birds that uh, live in India actually tend to like things that happen with rice cultivation in India, you know, flooding, the uh, a, a relatively low amount of uh, mechanization, 
the high amount of uh, farmer tolerance in the in the sense that they don't go and hunt the birds like many of the other areas of rice like vietnam or california where bird hunting is a very common sport so since we don't have all of those things it shouldn't be too much of a surprise but it's very nice to have a number that there are 65 bird species increasing as rice expands or rice continues uh, across india and these include some species that are very obvious things like the asian open bill stock which is a very special feeder on snails and snails of course proliferate where there is flooded rice it is in fact the biggest pest of rice fields next to rodents and wherever there are snails we are seeing around the world open bill stocks both in africa and in asia are actually expanding so these are some of the few large water birds that are actually expanding in uh, in global distribution because of rice and then we have species like this the plain primia an insectivorous bird very very nice to have insectivorous birds doing very well in artificial systems because these birds represent health of a health of a system and these can be knocked out very easily due to accumulation of pesticides accumulation of uh, other effects so very nice to have insectivorous birds like the primias and then you have omnivorous birds that also are just very easily to human beings and one shining example of that in the indian farmland system and the highway system is the bank miner that are just to uh, bridges on the highway that are just to farming systems and stuff so we have quite a nice variety of species that are increasing due to rice and if you look at whether certain kinds of birds are found in rice then this uh, in this graph i'll draw your attention to just the uh, right hand side extreme there is a huge under representation of woodland birds that's no surprise because obviously rice in india is grown without shade trees like coffee or uh, or some of the teas and we have a over representation of wetland species and grassland species and that is very nice because these are two groups that are also likely very rapidly declining in india so it may be that rice is providing birds with a buffer birds with otherwise would not have natural habitats to go with this includes also carnivorous species like the black neck stock in the photograph you can see that stock with four chicks four chicks is very unusual for large stocks like this which breed individually and uh, seeing so many chicks in a rice area is of course fantastic news we also have excellent populations of grass birds that are being discovered around uh, rice pockets that are associated with small wetlands which is again very good news what about diet this is a graph that i'll bring up again and again to showcase to you how uh, you know global trends uh, are either mimicked or not in india and here also you will see just the rice fields in india contrary to what is being seen around the world the dietary gills are not being affected too much just the rice fields are being able to maintain the entire complement of dietary gills more or less in the same proportions as what is found in the whole of india so this is very interesting in the sense that rice is behaving like how the ponds in delhi are behaving and able to pro providing a whole bunch of resources and therefore retaining much of the dietary diversity that is there in uh, in birds it includes things like the worm eating common sandpiper includes things like our resident uh, spot bill duck also we have 23 species of global conservation concern and this is of course some a, a list that people pay a lot of attention to because these are birds that require immediate conservation needs and it's very nice to see that artificial habitats are actually providing habitat for birds that probably otherwise would have suffered much much more than they are currently suffering this includes the species that I'll introduce you a little bit to in uh, later in the talk the sarus crane the world's largest flying bird black neck stocks i showed you a photograph of this bird earlier previously before our studies it was thought to require protected wetlands but now we know that the world's largest population actually occurs in human modified systems another bird with the same record and i'll show you a little bit of a new finding which is very heartening is the woolly neck stock which also was previously believed to require protected wetlands so what about the uh, birds that are using the farmlands of uttar pradesh so this particular uh, statistics that i will show you concerns these districts and uh, you can see in the map it's more or less the central bit of up which has lots of rice fields and we picked these areas because we were interested in the sarus crane so we also ended up counting all of the other birds that were found so if you take a satellite image this is roughly 2 kilometers across by 1 kilometer height so if you take a aerial photograph this is what uh, uttar pradesh would look like you have tiny but very heavily dense clusters of human beings and then you have one or two wetlands this large black thing that you see on your left that is a single wetland that is maintained for community use mm. completely opposite to what you will see of wetlands in temperate areas where those wetlands are maintained for birds or for water so these are not wetlands that are maintained for wildlife but maintained for human use so that's a huge distinction and so we are expected to see much less a diversity here what did we see again like delhi completely contrary to what we were expecting 
450 species and counting of birds with over 30% of these being water birds. Again, not too much of a surprise because I showed you the statistics for rice. They're over represented by water birds and that's what we are seeing here. But only 30% of them were water birds. 70% were actually non-water birds, which was a massive surprise to us. And so clearly there are things happening on these landscapes that we should uh, completely move away from assumptions or from gut instinct, you know, things like uh, experience and stuff. We should actually go in and explore. And you can see from these photographs that the variety of birds that we had was really nice. We had waders, we had uh, jasanas, we had ducks, and of course we had the world's largest population of the Saras cranes. Now think about this a little bit. The world's tallest flying bird, the largest population of this bird in the world is in the oldest, most densely populated farmland of the world. How much more wrong can you go with assumptions? And this also included incredible populations of birds that are very, very poorly studied, like this spectacular bird, the cinnamon bittern. It's called so because of its color. And then we have birds like the gray-headed lapwing that were previously thought to be coastal species, but we are actually seeing it all across the Gangetic floodplains, even using very tiny village ponds. And then we had birds that were well-known, I thought, well-known to be seabirds, things like this curlew and uh, we are actually seeing excellent populations, much, much higher than what you would expect. In the farmlands, look at the habitats of these birds. Uh, and this is a shot that I could take uh, hurriedly because these birds are very sensitive to human presence. They really don't like human beings like some of the other birds. And they immediately take off. But look at the habitat that they are seen in. You have mustard in the back. You have uh, recently harvested rice in the middle. And then you have peas in the foreground not a habitat that one would expect for things like the curlew. So clearly this landscape is full of surprises. So what is it that really helped or did not help the water birds? So when in the areas that had remnant habitat patches, so anything that you would call as classical habitat for birds, you know, trees and wetlands and grassland, things like that that were not human being oriented, as the amount of remnant habitat patches increased, the bird diversity increased. So clearly there are some patterns, some rules that are still holding out despite it being an entirely modified area. And what did not work, it is the intensification of rice cultivation. By this, I mean, as the amount of rice in a particular district increased in terms of percentage of the land that was under rice cultivation, as the percentage increased, and this is usually from west to east in a floodplain, because as, uh, as all of you know, as a river flows, uh, you will see lots more civilization, lots more people along, along the river as it approaches the sea, because that's just the nature of flood plains. And you will see more and more rice cultivation as you start moving towards Bengal. And as that happened, as we started to go towards Western UP, the bird diversity and the numbers of many of the birds decreased. So who benefited from the, uh, what were the habitat patches? These were things like, you know, riverine uh, on the sides of the rivers, we had scrubs and forests. And then we even had tiny, but very long strips of grasslands like this that proved to be enormously useful for a wide variety of uh, bird species. So we had spoonbills that benefited from wetland areas, green sandpipers, which is a migratory species, and breeding populations of things like the great egret. These were clearly benefiting for th from things like wetlands being retained on the landscape. Some of the birds did not respond, uh, respond well to intensification, and those included even common species like white-throated kingfisher, which sometimes is seen in Delhi, they really didn't like it as the amount of rice increased. So clearly they, re they require a little bit more of diversity. Little green heron did not do well. It's a specialist fish eater. And the other fish eater that uh, did not do well was the large cormoran. So as you went towards Eastern UP, you would see them less and less, or you would see them restricted to only one or two large water bodies. So what were the most abundant species? This is again a very interesting exercise to see whether our landscapes have retained a lot of diversity of resources for the birds. The most common a uh, bird that we saw across Uttar Pradesh was the common minor, which surprised me a little bit. Of course, I didn't know what to list because if you had asked me before I did the study, I really wouldn't have been able to come up with an answer as to what I would have thought was the commonest bird. The other one was the bank minor, and these are maps to show distributions and stuff. The large gray babbler, which is an insectivorous bird, was one of the commonest birds across uh, uh, Uttar Pradesh. Plain Premier, like I've showed you earlier, it matched up to its expectations. The house sparrow, which we believe, which uh, we otherwise incorrectly believe is uh, declining, it is there at least in the tens of lakhs just in these 24 districts. So it's not a species we should be concerned about. The black-breasted weaver was a species that is one of the commonest species of Uttar Pradesh, which was really fantastic because it requires reed beds to, uh, to nest in. So clearly, uh, 
there is something working on the landscape of Uttar Pradesh that is benefiting such a nice variety of birds. And of course, one of the birds that's being benefited quite nicely, uh, the world's largest population is the Saras crane. For those of you who don't know, these are three, the, these three cranes show a pair, the birds on the left, which are calling are a pair, and they are very annoyed at the uh, entrance of an interloper. So they're very territorial birds. Uh, pairs form territories which they defend, and they defend it largely with non-physical stuff because you know birds have hollow bones, so they try to avoid physical contact. And cranes have developed one of the largest repertoires in the animal kingdom, much more diverse than primates. And they're able to communicate each other with this repertoire, both vocally and also doing things like what the third bird is doing. It's uh, pretending to exaggerate its walk. So it's pretending that the other birds are not bothering it. And cranes are interesting in that uh, the Saras cranes, the males can be identified only when they are doing this call. The, the bird with the open wing is the male and the bird with the closed wing is the female. Otherwise, people tell me that the sizes are different and this, that and the other, but really there's a whole amount of variation. So I haven't seen too much systematic uh, you know, differences between males and females. So this is a common site in places which have a very high density of cranes. And this is a common site in the morning if you're roaming around with a motorbike. You will see two cranes come to the border of their territory and do this behavior. So the pairs on the left are doing a unison call or a duet. And the pairs on the right are doing what is known as a displacement preening. They are pretending they don't care about these two birds. And you will see how well synchronized these birds are. So it uh, goes to it sort of go, goes to show that the pair bonding in these birds is for very long times because they have such a lot of synchronized behaviors. So this kind of behavior is very nice for a lazy person like me because all I have to do is watch the cranes and know where the border of the territories is. And now I know two territories uh, very clearly that I can keep coming back and monitoring. So when I started the study, I was told to be very careful about visiting a crane nest because cranes were supposed to leave the nest and go away. Again, the fallacy of assumption. And because I did my work in Itawa, perhaps the birds had picked up some habits from the people. They definitely had not read the books written by the experts in the West. The moment I entered the water, the male attacked me and uh, I bal bal bach gaya bolte hai na, to wo ho gaya. And that was the first ever nest that I visited. So it served me really well as I went on to do uh, many other studies on Saras cranes, which I'm still continuing to this day. So behavior of birds can show that they're really strongly associated with people. And at least in Uttar Pradesh, the birds get their say when they are nesting and they're really not scared of the humans because the humans don't kill them. Within territories, they raise their chicks, which makes it a very nice system for people who want to study populations of endangered species, because you have to visit territories every year and see if that particular pair has succeeded in raising a chick. So we then uh, did this across multiple landscapes. This is the map that shows you how we track the cranes. The different colors shows you for that particular year, whether the crane had a chick or whether it did not, and whether it had two chicks. So using these things, we can then create all India or all South Asia maps like this, where the pie charts show you proportion of pairs which did not have a chick, proportion that had a one chick, proportion that had two chicks. And you can see from maps like this that in a particular year, there's a huge amount of variation between where you're doing the study. But overall, the large pie chart that you see on the top left-hand corner tells us that the cranes are doing pretty okay. Cranes live for more than 80, 90 years in captivity. So they likely do at least half of that in the wild. And so anything that is uh, any number that is more than 30% breeding success every year. So imagine that if, if you're living for 40 years, you start reproducing at about five years of age, 35 years of breeding potential. So every year, uh, you know, 35% of that population is producing at least one chick. That's a hell of a lot of cranes. And so they're doing pretty, they're doing pretty well. There is, of course, a little bit of interannual variation. This is a map for 2015-16, the same map constructed for 2016-17. Some variation in, so some places that had breeding the previous year does not have breeding this year. So I'll just go back uh, so you can see some variation in Kathmandu and uh, Lucknow, for example. And uh, this particular year, they had a lot of chicks. So you really can't study birds like cranes or any bird for that matter with one-off study or a, a single visit, you really have to pay attention to studying them over a slightly longer period of time and also study them in different areas before you come to a conclusion about how they might be doing. And the other species that I wanna quickly talk about is the woolly neck stock. It was uh, recently declared as a vulnerable species or a threatened species, and it was estimated to have less than 25,000 birds. It was a, a status given to it because it was deemed threatened by agriculture. That was the primary threat accorded to this species by the experts. Uh, 
And it was also described as a species that requires wetlands inside of protected areas, like what had been thought for the black neck stalks. Well, this photograph shows you a family with six chicks. This is a world record. There is no single nesting stock in the world that successfully fledged six chicks. This is a world record. So all the birds that you see on the right are young birds that we actually observed leaving the nest. And they were all begging to their adults who sort of had it had enough and they, they must have been wondering why they were trying to breed six chicks. They had an excellent breeding population in Haryana. It had the world's largest breeding population in fact. And this is what the habitat looks like. So completely contrary to what was being written about in literature, it was ancient traditional agriculture, the tradition of having canals, because these canals go back to pre-British era. They're very, very ancient canals. And they always have the habit of putting a row of trees for agroforestry purposes. This is not trees for wildlife. This is trees for cutting and using by people. But this is what is driving the magnificent population of woolly neck stocks in Haryana. Even individual trees like this, trees that are in uh, Hindu religion, things like fig trees and banyan trees. And you can see a nest on the top of this tree, uh, or almost on the top of the tree. And this nest is being used repeatedly year after year, which shows us that these birds really like old trees. And so it is a combination of traditional agriculture and agroforestry, and also some uh, uh, elements of Hinduism that is actually leading to one of the world's largest, most productive stock populations anywhere in the world. And this is the landscape where they are. It is not Bharatpur, it is not a protected Kaziranga kind of wetland area. And of course, just like the Saras cranes, these storks also have not read the books written by experts. They obviously don't require uh, protected wetlands. They obviously don't require uh, just uh, you know, forested areas. They're using mostly agriculture. They can do very well as long as they are not hunted. That's the only thing that they require. And also what did we find just in South Asia, not the global population, which was thought to be 25,000. We found that just in South Asia, the population is an estimated about two to three lakh birds. So that is magnitudes higher than that, what was assumed. Again, one of the strong reasons why we should really stop assuming things, even if we are trying to be on the safe side. So just to recap, uh, nearly 40% of Delhi's birds were found in less than 5% of tiny wetlands across the city. Maintaining ponds in Delhi is not for birds. It's largely for as parks or uh, as remnants or for temples, and it's largely for human beings. And it's providing what we can very safely define as an ecosystem service because these birds do a whole bunch of things. And the, we suspect that annually it comes to the tune of millions of dollars, just these ponds, nothing else, no other habitat type in Delhi. So imagine if you add, add all of that up, we are clearly having a very wrong impression of uh, mega cities. Several water birds of global conservation concern and also birds like avocets and stuff that we thought require undisturbed areas are using the city's ponds. And then we found some very interesting relationships between water birds and habitats. They did not always show negative impacts because of urbanization levels around the ponds, for example. This is decidedly odd. We don't know the reasons why. And that degraded habitats, because they were clearly full of trash, they were, some of the water was black, that these degraded habitats within a megacity is holding so many species, like I told you, is a world record. It's unprecedented. So very novel interactions. And one big question that raises is how widespread are these patterns? Are all Indian cities the same? Are all cities in the tropics the same? Should we now seek new generalities or should we actually be very careful and look at each city differently? And I know Dr. Barucha is here and he knows about Pune. Pune is a very different city. Bombay is a very different city. Kolkata, people who, are, who visited that area will know that very likely we, are, uh, we may find very different patterns for uh, birds in these cities. So very clearly, this is a question, but it's a loaded question that we should really move away from assumptions, definitely move away from global assumptions, but even locally, don't look at just one study. We really need to use this study to develop city-wise plans. What about farmlands? We found that Uttar Pradesh, even though it's the oldest, even though it's the most human uh, highest density, is the most bird diverse of any smallholder farm landscape anywhere in the world. Farmer habits, that is the way that they till the land and stuff are very likely, very important, but we definitely found evidence for small habitat patches, which we could measure. Individual species, especially some large water birds, totally defined patterns, totally, completely. And I showed you two examples, there are many other examples. And older the landscape and older the traditional farming we are seeing is a better thing for birds, completely opposite to what was being thought before. Where the nuance here is the kind of farming that is done and the kind of farmers that there are. In California, most farmers have guns. They will shoot anything that flies. 
if you go to uh, vietnam and thailand and stuff all of the farmers are always looking for food they're trapping everything on the landscape they're removing the beetles in the fields so obviously you have to look at nuance in a nuanced way as to what is the farmers that you're talking about and what is the kind of farming that you're talking about rather than trying to make this silver bullet strategies because these create assumptions that can then become incredibly problematic so some broad structural stuff so what are birds outside protected areas or just birds outside protected areas they are doing really well it's uh, being a record breaker i suspect it's going to be pretty different from most of the countries or maybe all of the countries in the world because i've been to uh, several countries and i've not seen anything like india so india does seem to be a record breaker why is it it's it's a question that is a very very large question will take multiple lifetimes of people to answer but i'm sure we can start approaching some of the answers the majority of populations of several species completely contrary to what we believe are not inside wetlands that are protected or forests that are protected but completely outside outside of that 5% map that i showed you earlier on the majority of the population of many species is outside those protected areas so this is something that we really need to start positioning ourselves as a unique country we need to start incorporating these uh, understandings into things like conservation planning into policy otherwise we will be putting all of our eggs into a few baskets that will miss a lot of opportunities for conserving other species several water bird species of conservation concern things like lesser agitan things like woolly neck stock sarus cranes i mean their status is very clearly wrong for the woolly neck stock we were able to do a re status assessment and we showed that it was not threatened so it was down listed to near threatened many other species are still included in threatened category because people have not studied them and people still assume that they are not found outside of wetland which is obviously very clearly wrong so is it feasible to update this update their status how quickly can we do it and doing that is very important because only then we'll be able to also update national and international conservation goals so a lot of people were involved in this and uh, of course the team from kriya who invited me very kindly to participate in today's talk and i'd like to thank all of these people for helping the work that's been going on since 1998 uh and i'd like to thank all of you for listening in i'll be very happy to take any questions if you have it thanks a ton gopi that was a fantastic talk uh brilliant i really enjoyed it uh before i ask uh, my questions i want to invite dr shivani jadeja to ask hers shivani please go ahead thank you thank you bharat uh dr sundar thanks so much for that uh, fascinating talk i've uh, you asked you answered a couple of my questions with your concluding slides but i've got two specific research specific questions one is about the rice fields how much do you think is the importance of the number of crops they take specifically the practices because just based on uh, for observation it seems like during times of the year when there isn't a crop being taken that it can form a semi wetland like condition for some uh, waders and uh, does that in your work do you find those conditions ha- being helpful or the crop itself standing there being uh, supportive of uh, such la high numbers uh, the uh, the second one's related to the the work with the urban ponds and uh, i'm wondering what is the role of uh, the areas being uh, in the migratory routes of these birds in terms of the numbers because if you think of an urban area and the water being a resource you can go and look at uh, places in uh, arid places in places like kutch where you don't have anything but the water and we see large numbers of birds coming over there you it, because it's in the path and of course the water provides a resource and so uh, is is this comparable and would not looking at these places uh, which are not in the migratory paths give us a very different idea of what urban spaces do those are my two questions thank excellent you excellent questions the first i mean both of them are million dollar questions quite honestly but i'll try to address them with the little bit of experience that i have so number of crops does matter the uh, also what matters is the kind of crops and the way that it's done so if you go to peninsular india you have three rice crops in many areas but those areas don't have as many birds so we think it's not just the kind of crop that happens but in the north uh, the kind of rice cropping that happens is entirely flooded it is completely congruent with what used to be the monsoon now things are changing up quite a bit so it really became a full flooded wetland except during the planting season and except during the harvesting season and then this was again followed up by crops that still remained conducive so things like wheat <coughs> wheat has what is known as pulsed flooding right they uh, flood the fields a little bit let the water go down and that is brilliant the sarus cranes for example have learned that during pulsed flooding they go and stand near a a rat hole and as the flood waters go in the rats come out and the cranes grab them and feed their young ones so they have learned this and a lot of birds have learned different ways because of the ways in which the farmers are uh, are doing the crops for example 
many water birds in the north time the initiation of the nesting period with the first flooding of the fields that is how closely connected things are in uh, many of the northern landscapes in the south things are very different because even though there are small holder uh, i mean comparable small holder landscapes the intensity seems to be much higher the amount of uh, remnant habitat seems to be much lower and also the monoculture rice all the time does not seem to be a good thing so there's a whole bunch of different things that uh, is happening and yes number of crops should matter but in the north we are seeing up to five crops being produced within a year in some of those landscapes but somehow <laughs> that doesn't seem to matter <laughs> <laughs> it's quite incredible it could be because of the base layer of the gangetic flood plain it's it's formed because of long erosion of a of a of a clay called kaolite so kaolite is supposed to be the most uh, you know uh, fertile thing on the planet and it's supposed to have the highest soil organisms it's supposed to have the highest productivity so definitely that has a role to play because if it was anything else but kaolite if you look at uh, the wet areas of rajasthan or if you look at the rice bowls of gujarat we definitely don't have this kind of stuff but there you have different mechanisms working things like khet talavdis in gujarat you have things like uh, uh, you know the like you said the migratory bird uh, areas those matter much more or perhaps uh, are added on values in those areas so i hope this answers your question to an extent urban ponds role of migratory routes yes we did look at tropical cities that are on other migratory routes delhi's numbers belay logic <laughs> it's uh, definitely helps to be part of the central asian flyway but if you look at cities in western australia if you look at cities in uh, thailand and uh, other places which have a little bit of systematic bird stuff if you look at uh, cities in south america which are also part of very important uh, but different uh, migratory pathways than the one that we have in india we still are unable to after controlling for that we are still unable to explain such a high diversity by migratory pathways alone so it looks like while that certainly helps of course it helps it cannot be the only thing that explains this very high diversity thank you so much achintya gurala please go ahead i wanted to thank you for this absolutely wonderful talk um yes. you know the general impression tends to be like oh humans are spreading everywhere and that's it birds are finished but i mean in that sense this was a really heartening talk and i'm like you know i'm so glad i attended i just wanted to share something actually because i'm from ashoka university and near ashoka like near the campus which is in sonipat haryana there is this village okay and then there's a pond there which is extremely polluted i think it's a pond of sewage but that pond has like such a crazy diversity of birds i mean there are like you know moor hens coots swamp hens headed goose i mean there's also spot billed duck and red red naped ibis it's like you know crazy diversity I mean, we we take our students to see the birds there all the time and such a dirty pond but all the birds are flocking to it and even these pipits and all these other birds we've seen that way it was like really good for me to know these things that you know certain human activities are actually benefiting at least certain birds if not all and it matters who the humans are i think <laughs> no, that is true that is true that is true but i just wanted to ask one thing like i mean have, have you also done any studies on whether i mean on bird diversity in the yamuna and delhi yeah we've done some stuff but i've seen that some of my colleagues from amiti have recently published on it with uh, wetlands international south asia and they have uh, also published on their own through the delhi university my, my uh, senior colleague dr urfi students has just recently published on the uh, biodiversity of the yamuna and they are seeing that even today the yamuna still retains pretty much the entire complement of bird but the numbers are very reduced like river lappings and stuff are really small in numbers which is you know to be expected because you get uh, uh, the the river is hemmed in on both sides so you don't have open areas you don't have reed beds you don't have anything despite the pollution which uh, i mean i personally don't think it's a very good thing to find very large numbers of birds continuously in a polluted water because it can't be doing good things to them and mm -hmm. we are seeing massive declines of gulls and terns and uh, many birds that nest in uh, uh, northern asia and a lot of those birds winter in indian uh, waters so the uh, the quality of stuff that we are putting into them is clearly uh, going to be taking a lot of the blame of these massive uh, declines that we are seeing at the global level yeah, yeah. but i mean again like you know a polluted pond like this one in the village i mean the pollution there is different from i mean yes. the pollution is mostly sewage i mean which is different from the level of chemical pollution that one would see in yamuna for example yes certainly certainly uh, dr bharut chaba please go ahead sir yeah, thank you very much uh, gopi thank you very much for an absolutely excellent talk thank you sir uh, uh, more because it really substantiates with numbers what i've been saying for quite a few years yes you have yeah it makes me feel 
makes me feel very good, you know. Uh, but <laughs> very important things uh, that birds do adapt. And I have seen this over from the 1960s onwards and realized how changing populations have happened in a place like Pune. Uh, and sometimes you get very, very big surprises. And, and perhaps these are not recorded sufficiently. You brought in those numbers, which I think is so very, very important. Uh, there are a couple of other things that I've been recently looking at. For instance, it's flight initiation distance of birds and, and how different species uh, react to human presence and the distance of human presence in urban areas and peri-urban areas. We find quite a difference. So there are many, many wonderful things that we need to do. But these other effective area-based conservation measures are going to be very, very important for us. We cannot now depend only on protected areas. We have to look at cultural landscapes of various types, including urban areas. I, we recently have uh, a, a solar plant, which I've been looking at, uh, which uh, had a uh, had breeding of Saras cranes inside the solar plant because outside there's nothing for it to live on. So uh, there's so much to do it this way, in, in this sort of thing. And not surprisingly, Salim Ali talked about this to me years and years ago. And, and we're just looking at it now and we're just scratching the surface. Thank you, Gopi. I really enjoyed this. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Now, just a, just a couple of uh, agreements, really. The importance of cultural landscapes and the importance of looking outside PAs in today's context cannot be overemphasized because they are using these assumptions that only protected areas are important to start converting wetlands or to start giving away wetlands as patas and stuff. And, you know, more studies like this are at least starting to showcase. I mean, we've done this successfully in Uttar Pradesh, where we've convinced uh, multiple chief ministers not to give the wetlands for uh, fisheries patas. And much to our surprise, they have agreed. But now things are changing in a very different direction. And unless we had a lot more of this information, Haryana, as you know, nearly 90% of the wetlands in several districts have been handed over for uh, fish farming because they use that very argument that these are not protected areas. So how could they be used? To? And unfortunately, we the lack of information proved to be a massive impediment in uh, trying to stop these statewide processes. So hopefully things like this, I mean, we are very, very, I'm one of the very few people doing this kind of work. More people are starting to do it. Uh, some of them because it gets very hard to get permits to go into forest areas. <laughs> but that doesn't matter because it doesn't, it doesn't matter to me as to why they're beginning to look at unprotected areas. I think it's very important that all of us uh, start to pay a lot more attention to, to what is immediately around us. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Vishnu, please go ahead. Uh, Gopi, I'm really an ignorant person uh, in your field. I'm completely an outsider. Hopefully not anymore. Uh, no, but in the, no, not in this. I think at least <laughs> you have enlightened me on this, on, on this topic at least. But there are some questions which are quite intuitive. For example, if 5% is protected areas, and 95% outside it. So it's quite intuitive to say that 95% should be important for, for the world of birds and, and, and animals, because after all, birds don't know that you have protected areas, right? The, the big animals may, but the birds uh, would not know which was protected, which is not protected. So this is uh, a very counterintuitive to uh, think otherwise. Second, a very anthropocentric kind of uh, question you know, when uh, a lot of people started writing about big cities, uh, uh, there was a big question mark which came up uh, in terms of human beings coming to big cities. People like Amitabh Kundu, my former colleague at JNU, and other people have been saying that these big cities like Delhi and other places are quite inhospitable mm -hmm. to the migrant people coming in and stuff like that. But still, the number was little the number is debated and kind of some people, some decline and so on, but there's still a lot of people are flooding into the big cities. Mm. Continue to, the number went up quite, it's almost like saying, is an anthropocentric question by saying that, look, even though there are some ponds and something, birds are also coming in, the point that you made, you know, that look, the birds have to come in. They, they, they don't really, you know, there's something out there for which they're coming. Like the individuals, human beings are coming to the big cities, despite the fact that they're inhospitable. They're not going to small cities, towns, because there's something else compensating for their terrible condition and so on and so forth. The final thing which I wanted to you to reflect a bit on the following Dr. Varucha's thing, we, in the other side of the story, in the sense that we don't really know what birds are thinking, 
what they're doing by, by remaining like this. The adaptive function, resilience, we talk about in case of human beings as resilience. Again, very anthropocentric assumption that, that human beings, despite difficulties, go and do something out of it. Is, are the birds also have resilience? Do they have something that we can say, which is uh, you know, a way of really reflecting that why they're still around? You know, although, as you say, <laughs> assumptions are saying that they should have disappeared, right? So uh, they're kind of, kind of, they're not, they're kind of curiosities of mine. So thank you. Yes, yes, very, I mean, they, these are very important. So in terms of 95% being available, this 95% does not have a lot of what is found in the 5%. So if you go to forest, for example, very large uh, diversity of fruiting trees that give fruits throughout the year, for example, that's not available outside the year. You look at the water quality, you look at the uh, very heavy density of uh, a very large amount of uh, insects and, uh, and plants and other stuff. So those have created a whole bunch of things that we call as specialists, right? So those are not found outside of forests. There are species that are not found outside of rivers because they don't have what it takes to live outside of rivers. So we do need this 5%. And it's not as intuitive to imagine that all the hornbills would suddenly be found outside. It's not because they don't find what they need outside. And that is why these assumptions have come about that we do need protected areas because those protected areas form, uh, in our case, microcosms. But in cases like Australia and stuff, they are the prominent landscape of the country because most of Australia is open country. And uh, so uh, we do require to keep them because there are species that cannot like elephants and hornbills and they cannot live in rice fields. So it's not as intuitive, but what was interesting for us is that the patterns that have held out in other areas, in uh, temperate areas and a whole bunch of other areas don't seem to be holding out here where the resilience and the elasticity that you're uh, referring to in your final point, that seems to pertain to a much, much larger species of birds and across a much, much larger diversity of feeding habits and uh, habitat requirements. And that is a question that is of great import, uh, even though this is just three or four studies as to how is it that these tropical birds seem to have a much wider resilience. And there, then you look at things like what Dr. Barucha alluded to, which is uh, what is it that's found outside? It is farmers that don't hunt uh, willy-nilly. It is people who are doing largely non-mechanized cultivation. So if you go to the US, for example, 95% of the uh, crop area in the Midwest is removed. All of the uh, plants are removed in one day or two days. That doesn't happen in Indian farming. Indian farming, the, each farmer plants the seeds and stuff based on individual decisions. So the planting and the harvesting, each of these things happen over months. They happen over two or three months. So you're looking at conditions that uh, have become prominent in the landscape because of the ways in which farming is going on in India. So if you bring that system here, we are very likely to see catastrophic declines because if you remove 95% of the primary productivity in two days, can you imagine the shock to the system? It is nothing else is available, no insects, nothing is available. So obviously there the, uh, the shocks that are provided to birds are just far too much for them to become resilient to. Whereas here, they are not really adjusting, but they have a system outside that they're able to still live off of. Gopi, there are a few questions on the chat box. Ah, yeah. uh, Hello, one Hello. is about uh, whether you used eBird data for any of your analyses. Uh, that is a very short question. Did you supplement your study with eBird data? Uh, the second is from Divya Prakash who asks, uh, according to you, what are the bird species of high concern that need urgent conservation in Delhi and CR? <laughs> Uh, also, what conservation issues and threats birds face in the capital region in the wetlands? Uh, so okay. these two were on the on the chat box. So if you could respond. <clears throat> so with data analysis, you have to be very careful about combining apples and oranges. So eBird is would be an apple, and the kind of systematic data collection we did would be oranges. So because one, we did not go to areas that birders go to. We went to all the areas across entire districts and stuff. So any map that we created where birds were found and not found were actually based on field observations. Whereas eBird is if you have lots of areas not showing the bird, that could just be a reflection of people not doing the birding, nothing to do with the bird. And so you have lots of other related problems with eBird. So we can't use eBird alongside information like this because eBird is largely also, as you know, whether the birds are there or not, even though 
some people are becoming a little bit better about putting in habits like breeding or carrying nesting material or with chicks or whatever. But most of the eBird information is just presence or absence. And even that is only areas where birders have gone to, not where the birds are found. So for our uh, purposes, because we wanted to do systematic population analysis, so and we were interested in the habits of the birds, eBird was a very, very poor replacement for us. And adding on information simply because some information is available is a very, very messy for those of you who know uh, how to handle information that then is extremely difficult to handle in terms of statistical analysis and in terms of population modeling, because that's not really data, right? That's not, that's data relevant in terms of birding behavior. And so how do you analyze data that comes in or observations that come in uh, with relation to birding behavior as if it relates to birds? That's a huge jump of confidence. So eBird and other things like that have to be handled with a lot of care. There are some uh, aspects of eBird, like how the, how the Kerala Atlas was done. Everybody went to predetermined grids. Everybody went on the same day. So those are also found on eBird. But those bits of information you can analyze using similar statistical tools and similar ethos where the jump is not too much that the birder's behavior was actually based on systematic sampling. Whereas other components of eBird and stuff, especially now we are seeing uh, some of the reviewers going in and deleting records or blocking some records because they believe they know where birds are found. So that sort of defeats the purpose of eBird. eBird is supposed to be looking at uh, information that volunteers are putting up and then creating maps. And now we are getting the reverse where people have decided what the maps are and they are going in and blocking the records because they don't believe that the birds are found there. So eBird is becoming more and more problematic, especially in the Indian context, because of a lot of these arbitrary, it's already messy to begin with. When the volunteers alone are involved, it's already messy. But then we start to have these reviewer-based and uh, you know, uh, eBird central-based uh, uh, interventions. Now it has just become a mess. So now eBird is not a reliable source of information anymore, because even distribution information, we don't know how much of it has been cleaned out. And cleaning out is really not a good thing to do in citizen science, because then it is neither citizen nor science, right? It's somebody who's paid, who has the job, who's going in and deciding what the distributions are. So eBird has a lot of problems just now, especially now in the emerging cleaning up scenario and deciding, pre-deciding what the bird distributions are. Imagining that birds are static. You know, we heard birds are definitely not static. So imagining that 30 years ago, you could not have seen a species there, therefore please change your uh, bird identity. So those are all very serious problems that eBird is now undergoing. And we don't believe that it's now usable as a source to inform as to how birds are doing. And it certainly should not be a source on how to inform how to do conservation because of these issues. These are easily solvable, but hopefully there will be more conversations about eBird because a lot of people like me are uh, dedicated to eBird for a very long time, way before Bird Count India and stuff like that. So we really take these uh, issues seriously and we will bring it up in forums and other places where these things can be solved out. But even otherwise, you have to be a little bit careful about handling information that is provided by volunteers. The second question about uh, what are the big issues of conservation in Delhi and what are the species of concern? I mean, you look at those photographs of the ponds that I showed you, those are all issues. Concretization when you should have left them soft, putting too many trees around uh, ponds when the, they should have been left open for open area birds, starting to fill ponds with uh, concrete and putting fountains and uh, things like that, which are not really natural. If you put an island, it's actually good because what we found was Ponds with islands on average had 11 to 15 more species than ponds without islands. And the island could be anything. It could be a fountain, it could be a dead tree, it even could be an old compound wall. And those, those ponds tended to have many more species because they were just less disturbed. They could uh, just uh, sit securely in the middle of the pond. So the ways in which we are handling it, the ways in which we are putting in uh, both industrial and sewage stuff, plastic is a massive, massive threat. The way in which people are using these ponds previously, it used to be for uh, uh, recreation and stuff. And now you're seeing a lot more invasive uh, uses, which are not very good for birds, not good for people either, because they should not be getting into the water of those uh, ponds. God knows what is the water. The species of, uh, uh, of conservation things, yes, we do have species that are listed by IUCN. Of course, those are global uh, level species. But if you start looking at Delhi, species that used to be more common, and, and that's a place where eBirds should have been useful. Unfortunately, it's getting less and less useful that way. But uh, we do have records of people like Dr. Baruch, Dr. Sally Mali, Dr. I mean, uh, Britishers, if you look at the Hume's records, if you look at uh, you know, records before that, they provide a very interesting, uh, like when we, when we were looking at the woolly neck stock, we were alerted to A.O. Hume's uh, writings of his colleagues in 1830. And in 1830, A.O. Hume's colleague had told him that Dalbergia sisu was a very important tree for woolly neck stocks to nest. 
And to this day, most of the nests of woolly stocks in that area in Haryana are still on Dalbergia sisu trees. So clearly, even though they are anecdotal, they're very carefully done. They're very, uh, uh, you know, the, those were natural history of a very rare order. And uh, nowadays, people want to do things quickly. They want to do things using available information. So we have to be a little bit careful about trying to do that. But if you can sort out the information that exists, you will try and start building which species may have started to decline in Delhi. Unfortunately, today's data is also as rare as yesterday's data, right? Because of very few people working in Delhi. Most people go to Nawab, uh, you know, Najafgarh, or they go to Okla, or they go to places where they can see some species that they're interested in, or they can see a lot of species. So across Delhi, to do systematic studies like what we did, looking at the city as an entity, is still very rare. So you will still have to do a little bit of sieving of all of the available information. We have provided some indicators in our work, and it's freely available online. So you can just check for our, our work in Journal of Urban Ecology. We have the appendices and everything available freely for download. And in that appendices, you can see which birds we have tagged as being globally threatened and which birds are actually found in very low numbers. So that will give you an idea of the kinds of birds that deserve our immediate conservation attention. Gopi, we have uh, time for two more questions, I think. So can I call on Karthik and then Hema, please? Uh, thank you very much, sir, for the wonderful talk. I mean, for the first time, human as a species, I'm feeling good. We are doing something good. I don't know. Uh, so uh, thank you for that. Uh, since now, a lot of mega cities would be coming in. Uh, are you also working on a rule book? What kind of development activities will be, you know, when, when the development activities are happening? Uh, are you working on a rule book? What activities are good? What activities are bad? I mean, the general rule, as you can imagine, the general pattern of removing anything that is more natural and moving towards less natural, not very good. But even for the ponds of Delhi, what we noticed was the diversity of the conditions of ponds are very large. And that is because each pond is managed differently. Some are managed by resident welfare associations. Some are managed by DDA. Some are managed by the sewage corporation. Some are managed by the uh, railways department. Because of this diversity of ways in which they managed one habitat, ponds, we are seeing such a large diversity of birds. So I think a rule book may actually be in contravention of what we require to do. In Delhi, each pond needs to be managed on its own. They need to go in and see what it has. If it has islands, keep it with an island. If it has uh, grasses on the side, keep it with grasses. If it has two or three trees in the middle, keep it with two or three trees. Don't try to convert everything into a Bharatpur or don't try to convert everything into one pond where you saw a particular species that you like. That is really not a good idea for any management regime. So a rule book, throwing away rule books might be the best thing. But making sure that any concretization that you do is done sensibly. I mean, if you put a house in a flooded area, we've seen all across the country what's happening when you do that. We've seen it all the way from Kashmir. You know, you saw it in Hello. Chennai recently. You saw it in multiple places. Hello. When you put uh, concrete into Hello. wetland areas or if you put uh, houses into areas which have leopards and tigers, I mean, that's... You know, it's it's really not sensible. It doesn't require rocket science or it doesn't require very acute prescriptions for you to understand those fairly logical things to do. But what we are looking yeah. at is, you know, because people do work under different constraints, not everybody can uh, look at uh, just species because they are answerable to people and other things. And also there's a whole lot of corruption that goes on in uh, massive city formations. And the, we know that there are scams that have been revealed and stuff. So people are making money off of this as well. So they are not amenable to open and logical discussion. But any place that can retain a lot of its nativity, any place that can, like in Delhi, has retained most of its ponds or small grasses or small Aravali, uh, you know, if you're in the Aravali areas, retain, a small, uh, retain all of the hillsides, those are going to be very beneficial. Any roadside trees that you do, do it with a little bit of thinking, talk to an ecologist, talk to a botanist in the area, uh, try and increase diversity of the roadside trees that will be massively beneficial to the city five or ten years down the line so those are simple things that you need to do a rule book might be counterproductive because you know as in the indian government even with things like education or health or anything any rule book is proving to be disastrous for us because we have a diversity of conditions okay so based case to case this has to be taken care of it has to okay. yeah. and, and use some logic you know if you're if you're doing it in kriya then figure out what the Eastern Ghat species are that required to be planted in Kriya. Don't plant something that you saw in Delhi. I mean, it, the, the one you saw in Delhi may be found in the Eastern Ghats, then you're okay. But if it's a tree that's not supposed to grow in, uh, in the Eastern Ghats and it grows only in the Aravalis, then you've done a mistake. Even though you had the best intentions, you have done a mistake. Wonderfully answered. Thank you very much, sir. Ajay, please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Lord Gopi, for enlightening us. Uh, my question is... Uh... 
uh, although within the city areas or in the outskirts, whatever wetlands we have, so, uh, I, I can see the diversity more or less is there, but the population counts have decreased a lot. Can you, I mean, uh, yes, enlighten me on it? I mean, what? what I mean, is those are just indicators that the amount of food or amount of, uh, if they're breeding birds, then the amount of breeding areas available, available to them have declined. I mean, we know that, you know, for example, uh, artificially feeding birds in cities will inflate populations of one or two bird species like the rock pigeons. And the rock pigeons are very aggressive species. They will go and take over all of the breeding habitats of all of the smaller birds or less aggressive birds. So anything that you do which uh, changes the availability of resources will cause uh, either increases or decreases in uh, populations. And it is a sign that our cities are not doing well with providing resources to maintain large populations of say insectivorous birds or say fruit eating birds because as you know very few cities maintain fruit uh, trees because they don't like fruits falling on the cars we don't like to clean up the fruits in front of the houses and the shops every day so we do things that bias our opinion as to which tree to plant based on our daily habits so those things are of course going to have implications on what kinds of birds and how many birds can live in a city thanks uh, my question is more uh, regarding the wetlands i mean there the population not on of the migratory has devastated like anything i mean so this year That's is a very odd year this year we are seeing low numbers in most places but what we are also seeing is very many ponds with lots and lots of birds with uh, many birds and ponds which didn't have birds before have lots of uh, birds this year so it could be i am hopeful that this is an indication of the very unusual winter rains that we had in november and january because of the cyclones so wetland birds, it looks like they seem to have a ton of habitat to move around. They don't need to come to the same habitat this year. So I hope that I'm correct about this. And next year, we will see a renewal of uh, large numbers in the ponds that used to have large numbers because the water availability conditions are back to normal. Okay, thanks. My question was about the comparison between mega cities that you brought up. Uh, and I just wanted to pick your brains on that a bit. I mean, for me, the data that really stood out was 180 water birds in Delhi out of a possible 1,300 on the subcontinent. So almost a tenth of the species that you see in, in Delhi alone is a tenth of... Uh, uh, just the ponds. In just the ponds. And then you mentioned the number 400, uh, which now becomes one third of possibly all the, all the birds on the subcontinent. So I was just wondering if this is largely a biogeographical chance event uh, that is leading to this and whether you would be able to compare this to equivalent biogeographical uh, chance events with cities elsewhere. So, for example, you know, uh, the, the official capital city of Brazil is in the, is in the middle of the forest, I think, but uh, other places are, uh, are possibly not that way. So that's one question that I have for you. The second is, again, related to this only. When you think of mega cities uh, in, in some parts of Europe or the continental US, for example, they have tended to be green field projects, which means that they've flattened the entire landscape and built the city according to the way they wanted to. That's very different from Delhi, which has kind of grown very gradually, uh, uh, preserving some of its older structures and not eliminating all of them. So I was just wondering if that analysis that you, that you, that you presented to us uh, whether you know what what you think of this particular uh, you know, side? Yeah, so this is exactly the kind of discussion that we are bringing to the table now. After presenting the numbers, what we are doing with the discussion is let's stop pretending that cities have the same history. Let's stop pretending that cities ha that cities have the same characteristic. Delhi, for example, is multiple conurbations have come together to form the mega city. There are places that have not been disturbed for ages. There are temple ponds and trees that have remained uh, distinct. You have the Aravalis. So comparing Delhi to Buenos Aires is just, I mean, or, or, or even to, or, or maybe some, somewhere in uh, California is just absurd. So we really should not be bringing out these rule books that uh, people are bringing out saying that as, uh, you know, if you increase 10% of uh, concretization, you are likely to see 30% decline. That's all rubbish. I mean, those would be suitable only for the cities where the studies have been done. And I think overextending the argument beyond your study area, we know is a really poor replacement for actually going and figuring out the nuances and including the variables that matter to a model. So this is very poor modeling that's been going on. And this is largely because people have been working with similar cities, cities that were built out of flattened areas. And so everybody thinks that all cities are like that because, or at least everybody in the West 
uh, things like that. And then the South Americans have done an enormously good job of showing that, listen, we need to stop talking as if all cities are the same. And the example that you gave uh, keeps coming up in literature now, where because those people have now done a lot of work to show you have toucans, you have all sorts of birds inside the city. So you have hippopotamus now because uh, some drug smuggler introduced them there. And so you have all these uh, historical components, uh, nuances that are related to individual components of history, a single year, a particular dictator. All of these things have to be looked at very carefully instead of saying the 180 of ponds of Delhi is equivalent to the 46 of Sweden. That is an absurd way to look at things. So the presentation that I gave was primarily to challenge your imagination and to challenge people's thinking about the assumptions that have been built up. The assumptions have been built up in the way that you suggested, which is direct comparisons. And really, it's absurd to do direct comparisons. Thanks, Gopi. So uh, last question from Mahesh, and I'm, then I think we can wind this up. Mahesh, please go ahead. Uh, Karthik has a... Karthik's typed out his, uh, his question on the chat. So yeah. if you want to take a look at it, uh, Gopi, and then... Yes, yes, yes. I've read a little bit about this. Yeah. I mean, there's a whole amount of emerging thing coming out, especially from uh, South America. Paraguay, for example, has just completed their uh, tribal language and tribal annual calendar. It's a really remarkable exercise in Paraguay. They have mimicked the methods of New York. And uh, there's a whole bunch of linguistic stuff coming out and they're showing exactly the same thing. There are pockets of uh, what they're calling as remnant, but it's not actually remnant. It's they're the original owners. They've always been there. They've just not been eliminated. So similarly to ponds in Delhi, the ponds haven't been eliminated. They've always been there. And uh, the birds uh, have always been using it. Absolutely. There's a lot of parallels to be had. And in uh, places like Paraguay and in places, a couple of other places in uh, Africa that I'm engaged in, they are showing that the areas with very, very high amounts of bird diversity in human modified areas also tend to have a very high amount of cultural aspects like languages and like uh, annual calendars. So there's, uh, a, it's a huge emerging field, especially as people from the global south, as we call it, are becoming a lot more active within their individual places of residence and using methods that are relevant to their places of residence rather than using you know, blind questionnaires or mail-in questionnaires, which really doesn't work in most of the world. Two points. One, uh, Randhawa in the history of Indian agriculture has a very interesting details on the canals and planting. And the Siris and Shisham, the Dalbarga, Sisu, and the other three are very, very important. And it's uh, the change in the kind of tree planting choice may be very significant. And Northwest India, in his work, uh, N.C. Saxena has looked at trees that were planted. And it would be very interesting to do a correlation of the long term implications of tree planting. Uh, that would be one. <laughs> Second, and I've asked you this earlier, but I will come back again because I think many years ago I heard you speak and I can't remember the answer. But I, you know, there are certain uh, iconic bird sanctuaries in our minds. Sajna Khali, Vedantangal, and of course in Northwest India, the Kelodev Gana, Harike Lake, and Sultanpur. Do you think that just as you know, our view of the big faunal conservation is dominated by a certain view, Rantambor paradigm or whatever, Veer Forest paradigm. Do you think this paradigm is preventing us from seeing? So the reason I'm asking is that almost half century ago, there's excellent work in Delhi Zoo by Malhotra. And he didn't publish learned journal papers, but he really kept on counting the painted stock babies and fledglings and all. And I think we tried to help him, but we counted very badly. So we were very bad volunteers. The other is a study of, you know, the black kites of Delhi by a Russian zoologist who did fantastic work. So given this work, and you know, I was thinking of a book now out of print, Usha Ganguly, Birds of the Delhi Area. It's a phenomenal book. Some of the things you are showing is that the landscapes shown by Usha Ganguly may have got destroyed, but other waterscapes and landscapes have come up. So is it the, the iconic uh, uh, wetland which has prevented people from continuing these pioneers? Are you renewing the work even as you are bringing very modern new techniques? Sorry. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in our, uh, the, for the, on the first point on Indian agriculture, we've referred to exactly these two papers and a couple of other books in our work in uh, William X. Talk because we show that this is not a new thing. It's just that the bird people have never imagined these areas to also have birds simply because they followed Western traditions, which dictated that large water birds are not found in heavily uh, high density farmlands. And if you read the book on uh, the, the authoritative book on stocks of the world, they have a very interesting paragraph on woolly neck stocks. They say that this bird is very hard to study, least of the reasons of which is because it shares the same habitat as the tiger. So that is the imagination of the conservationists in India, which have followed a Westerner who came into India. 
and given his description he probably went to ranthambore or corbett and he saw woolly neck stock there and he imagined the woolly neck stock uh, habitat to be just that and so we really need to come out of these protected area systems because there is a lot out there and as dr barucho also alluded to i mean if we don't come out soon enough we won't see the changes you know like usha ganguli's book for example is a good example of documentation of change for one city we don't have this for many other areas and we need to do it very quickly because our the city, the i mean our landscape is very different from the western landscapes the second one the paradigm absolutely i mean if you go to any wetland conservation plan in the country all of them are identical and they are based on bharatpur and that is a huge huge loss because much like you have a diversity of forests much like you have a diversity of grasslands you have a diversity of wetlands each wetland type is different if you it depends on the geology it depends on the history of the use of the area each other is different we have we barely even begin to document that diversity let alone know uh, how to manage wetlands of different uh, types and if we bring in the bharatpur uh, system into all of these wetlands we are clearly we may benefit some bird but we probably are destroying a lot of other uh, potential stuff absolutely so i think uh, this was a really uh, mahesh has, has one more point that is put down is there one western landscape or are countries like eastern europe or the iberian peninsula and part of france and italy more similar uh, to the itawa kind of uh, area yeah they, they are similar only because there is a huge amount of subsidy for the farmers to flood the uh, fields to keep the conditions conducive for birds so nothing really resembles itawa which happens naturally by the farmers doing it themselves mm. Thank you so much, Gopi, for your time. This was a fantastic, splendid uh, talk. Uh, I think all of us really, really enjoyed it. Thank you to the audience for coming. Uh, thanks, Nanika, for setting this up, and our IT team for also making sure that the Zoom thing went so smoothly. Uh, so, thank you all.